The LA Kings lose their grip on second place in the Pacific Division thanks to a loss in Edmonton to the Oilers. I'll tell you why Kings fans should be disappointed but not discouraged. However, there is something to be concerned about. Plus, should Connor McDavid have been ejected for his hit on Mikey Anderson? That and more in this edition of Locked on LA Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Kings. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Kings fans, welcome to Locked on LA Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked on LA Kings your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Please like and subscribe if you are enjoying this content. My name is Eddie Garcia. I'm your host of Locked on LA Kings. I've worked in sports media for almost 30 years, 20 plus years at the Fox Sports Radio Network. I'm also co-host of the Puck Podcast. It's a weekly NHL review show that's putting out content for the past 16 years and a passionate LA Kings fan. For 30 years, the LA Kings lost their big showdown in Edmonton against the Oilers Thursday night by a score of two to nothing. The big news going into the game was the fact that Jonas Corposalo was starting in net and that Kings leading scorer Kevin Fiala was a late scratch and would not play in the game. We'll get more into the injury issues and the goaltending with the LA Kings in just a minute. Uh, with that loss, the Kings drop out of second place in the Pacific Division. They're one point back of Edmonton. Uh, so the Oilers have 97 points, the Kings 96. At the moment, Edmonton would have home ice advantage in a first-round playoff matchup between the two teams if, of course, the standings were to stay the same as they are today. And while this is a disappointing result, I don't think Kings fans should be discouraged. I've used that term a few times this year to kind of talk about these types of games. And what, what does that mean in the broad sense that the Kings played well and they lost to a team that had a hot goalie We've seen this, unfortunately, the last couple of games. Uh, Edmonton, obviously, is a better team than Calgary, but we'll, we'll, there are positive things to take away from this game. And we'll start up front with the Kings, again, getting a ton of quality scoring chances. They did the same thing in their previous game in Calgary, but once again, a couple of different factors. Number one, the Kings, to their detriment, failed to convert on golden opportunities, most notably at Adrian Kempe breakaway in the second period, and they also did run into a goalie who had a very good game. The Kings got 43 shots on goal in this loss against the Oilers. It's the second most shots on goal for the Kings in a game this season, but they could not get one past goalie, Stuart Skinner, who is still a goaltender that has yet to really prove himself on the big stage. That was a nice win for him. Uh, I'm not a huge believer that he's a guy who's going to carry this Oilers team far in the playoffs, but for a night, he certainly got the job done for Edmonton. The Kings right now, to use a baseball analogy, since we've gotten the baseball season just underway, the Kings right now are a team that's getting a lot of hits. They're putting runners on. They're getting them in scoring position, but they are not driving them home right now. Clearly, the Kings could have used Kevin Fiala, could have used Gabe Velarde, um, guys who obviously can put the puck in the net, leading scorer in Kevin Fiala, but teams have to overcome the, those types of things, unfortunately. And the Kings weren't able to do it last night. The Kings did do a great job of keeping that Oilers historically good power play from being a factor in the game last night. And if they meet again, they're going to need to keep that formula going forward. The Kings killed off both of the Oilers power plays last night, uh, only gave the Oilers two power play opportunities, which was great. Um, the Kings really only took one, you know, if you want to call it a bad penalty, Alex Iafalo took an interference penalty when he, I think I got a little frustrated with getting tied up with an Oilers player on the boards. He kind of grabbed him and slung him around. Um, the other penalty was preventing a, a scoring chance. So that's a penalty you'll accept all day long. The Oilers are now 0 for 9 on the power play against the LA Kings this season. And again, the way the Oilers have been lethal on the power play this season, that's amazing. And again, if the Kings can keep, certainly not probably, you know, they're not going to keep, if they meet the Oilers in the playoffs, it's extremely unlikely that they will keep the Oilers from scoring a power play goal. But again, uh, so far the penalty kill, has shown the ability to match up very well against the Oilers' power play. And again, if they meet in the playoffs, that's a huge, huge factor in whether the Kings can advance uh, by beating them in the series or not. I think probably the biggest thing to be encouraged about from the Kings' performance was the play of goaltender Jonas Corposalo, who made back-to-back -back starts for the first time since joining the Kings uh, just before the trade deadline. He was 
I thought very solid, making a lot of key saves. The two goals he allowed were not soft goals. The first one was a great pass from Oilers star Leon Dreisaitl into the middle of the ice to Evander Kane, who's a guy who knows how to put it in the net. And he kind of shot it through LA Kings defenseman Vladislav Gavrikov. Maybe that just that split second of of um, Corpusello not being able to see the release of the shot maybe made the difference on the goal. But I don't think that was a soft goal. Uh, the second goal was a Connor McDavid breakaway. And uh, we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But uh, yeah, Connor McDavid on a breakaway, that's uh, that's not one you're going to stop very often. Um, Corpus Allo ended up with uh, two goals allowed on 37 shots. And you know, Corpus Allo now making, as we mentioned, back-to-back starts for the first time. Is this Todd McClellan giving him the nod that he is now going to be the LA Kings' number one goalie going forward? And I'd have to say yes. Um, you know, not that if something happens, maybe an injury or, you know, if the play just isn't to, to, to snuff, that the Kings would have any hesitation turning to Phoenix Copley and feeling good about that. But I think that Corpus Allo has been playing better of late. He does have the playoff experience. And let's be honest, they, they brought him in not to just solidify the situation in that, but I think ultimately in mind, they did have it that if he performed well, that he would be the guy to take over the number one goaltending position. And, you know, you're not going to trade for a guy, sit him on the bench, and then he's a, he's an unrestricted free agent and ask him, hey, come back again next season. I think it all plays a factor. But most importantly, he has been playing well and he has that playoff experience. So it could change down the stretch. But I also think that it makes a lot of sense that at this point in the season, right, with two and a half weeks to go or a week and a half to go, that it's time to solidify the situation in net if you're the Kings. It's time to pick a goalie, let that goalie get the bulk of the starts going down the stretch, let the team get used to him being in net, and then go with it in into the postseason. Again, you've got a good second option if you need it, which is great, but I think it was time, and I, I understand why Todd McCullough made the decision, and I think it is your, Jonas Corposalo's net to lose uh, going down the stretch. He's the number one goalie right now, I think, for the LA Kings, and I think Phoenix Copley will get a couple of starts uh, certainly over the weekend when the Kings have back-to-back games, he'll get one of those games uh, in that either in uh, Vancouver or in Seattle. But Jonas Corposal is the guy, and I thought the first game where he, I don't know that he knows he's the number one guy, but right there's all kinds of circles, circumstantial evidence to suggest he's now going to be the number one guy. I thought a, a good first start for him in that position. So what is the biggest concern for the Kings coming out of the Oilers game. I don't think there's any question. It is the health of this team. Now, most of the the season, the Kings have been pretty much at 100%. There's been a few times where guys have gotten nicked up here and there and missed a a few games or a week or two. But the overall health of the Kings has been a major reason why they've had a lot of success this season. And now we've got Kevin Fiala, we've got Gabe Velarde, we've got Mikey Anderson all injured. uh, And it's a big concern. These are key pieces and we need these guys for the playoffs. Now, the good news is that it appears that Fiala and Velarde are day-to-day, and we expect them to come back here soon, certainly before the playoffs. Don't know at this point about Mikey Anderson. There's been no update on his condition as of the recording of this show. Hasn't been placed on injured reserve, um, but it clearly looks like you know he, he went hard into the boards. His head hit the glass. It's not unreasonable to think it could be you know a head issue, um, some sort of a concussion. And those things are always tricky to diagnose and to figure out when a player can come back from that. The Kings have called up defenseman Tobias Bjornfoot from the Ontario Reign on an emergency basis. So it looks like Anderson is out indefinitely. Again, no definitive word on what um, we're looking at for Mikey Anderson. If something comes out over the weekend, certainly we'll tweet it out. We'll talk about it, obviously, on the next show, which comes up on Monday. But, you know, how is this now going to affect the defensive core? For the LA Kings? It's a great question, and I'm not sure I have an answer at this point. We'll find out certainly over the weekend how the Kings want to start to address it, and hopefully they won't have to address it very long. But obviously, Drew Doughty and Mikey Anderson have been the Kings' top pairing all season long. As a matter of fact, Mikey Anderson had played in every game to this point. Uh, Drew Doughty had played all but one game, so they've been together the whole season. So this is uncharted territory as far as this season. Of course, Drew Doughty was hurt last year, and the Kings had to make adjustments. But for this season, this is not a position that Todd McClellan uh, and uh, the defensive core has had to deal with. So what do the Kings do? Do they move Vladislav Gavrikov from the left side on the second pairing 
up to the first pairing just to re- replace Mike Anderson? Does everybody just kind of move up a slot and then they replace, um, you know, the third pairing with Tobias Bjornfoot or maybe Sean Dursey or Sean Walker move over from the right side to the left side? Uh, they're all options, um, and we just don't know how it's gonna how it's gonna work out. We've seen Dursey on the left side before they acquired Gabrikov. Uh, we've seen Sean Walker in the past play on the left side. So I don't know if it's going to be a situation where maybe they plug and play Tobias Bjornfoot on the top line. I mean, he's not as talented as Mikey Anderson. He doesn't have the experience, obviously. But we're talking about, hopefully in the short term, a defensive defenseman filling that same kind of a role, playing that same kind of a, situ- in a situation. And then you keep the other the other pairings the same. I don't know. Again, maybe everyone slots up one and then they put Bjornfoot on the back end or they move Jersey or Walker over to the left side. Um, we'll see. We, we don't know how it's going to work out, but it is a certainly an interesting situation. The Kings are going to have to address, and hopefully it's something they will not have to address for very long. So to put a bow on the game against the Oilers, uh, I think Kings fans, again, disappointed with the result, sure, but I don't think you should be discouraged because the Kings are still playing good hockey, I think they're getting quality chances. They just need to finish, get a couple of those chances to go home a little bit. I think we should be encouraged by the play of Jonas Corposalo. I think we should be encouraged specifically against the Oilers of how the Kings have played against their power play, if that is a matchup we see later on in the playoffs. Um, But yeah, right now, the Kings uh, still have a lot to play for. There are still some very important games going down the stretch. And even though the Kings have lost their hold on that second spot, there is no reason to believe they can't get it back. And there is no reason to believe they can't still make a run at the division title. Like I said, still a lot of very important games left to come. All right, we need to get into the Connor McDavid hit on Mikey Anderson. We're going to do that in just a second. But first, I want to remind you that today's episode of Locked on LA Kings is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. The NBA season is also winding down. And now is a great time to get in on all the action with FanDuel. You can download the FanDuel app. It's America's number one sports book. New customers get a no-sweat first bet. It's up to $1,000 in a bonus bet. If your first bet doesn't win, just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can place a bet on everything from the money line to points scored to three-pointers made. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. So don't miss your chance to get in on a no-sweat first bet, up to $1,000 in bonus bets. When you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, we waited long enough to get into the most controversial part of the game on Thursday night in Edmonton. And just a minute, 28 seconds into the game, Oilers superstar Connor McDavid hit Kings defenseman Mikey Anderson from behind into the boards. McDavid was called for a two-minute minor boarding penalty. Mikey Anderson laid on the ice for a while, slowly got up, left the game, left the ice, and did not return. So the question is, should Connor McDavid have been assessed a major penalty for boarding and ejected from the game? Well, let's go to the old NHL rule book, rule 41.1, boarding. A player incurs a boarding penalty for body checking a defenseless opponent into the boards with a degree of violence up to the discretion of the referee. Players must be responsible for their decision to use body contact in a game, so players initiating hits must ensure their opponents are not defenseless. 41.2 minor penalty. The referee shall say a boarding penalty was only violent enough to warrant a minor penalty. 41.3 major penalty. The referee can say a boarding penalty was severe enough to warrant a major penalty and 41.5 game misconduct penalty. If the referee invokes 41.3 and assesses a major penalty for boarding, he must also assess a game misconduct for the major penalty for boarding that results in an injury to the face or head. So here are the facts as I see it. Connor McDavid hit Mikey Anderson square in the numbers, forcing his upper body into the glass, and he sustained an injury. To me, that is a major penalty. It caused an injury, and Connor McDavid should have been ejected. Obviously, this is a judgment call on the referee's part. I will say this, and this is an opinion. It is not a fact, but I think it's a very strong opinion. If Mikey Anderson would have hit Connor McDavid in the exact same way, and Connor McDavid was laying on the ice, I have zero doubt the referees would have called a major penalty, and Mikey Anderson would have been ejected from the game. Because Connor McDavid is a star player. 
and he gets star treatment and he was allowed to stay in the game. Now, if you're a sports fan, this isn't rare. Uh, this is something that happens in sports, like it or not. And I'm not implying that the referees somehow said before the game, hey, boys, let's make sure we give McDavid the benefit of the doubt. Um, but this is something we see in sports. Hits for or against star players are commonly called differently. Now, keep in mind, there is also history between McDavid and the Kings and Mikey Anderson and the Oilers. Now, if you don't remember, Connor McDavid was called for a five-minute major for boarding and a game misconduct in a game against the Kings last December for a hit on Adrian Kempe from behind. Now, you may say, well, why didn't Connor McDavid get the star treatment in that instance? Well, in that instance, the referees pretty much had no choice but to call it a major because the hit on Kempe drew blood. And if you watch hockey, you know, anytime you draw blood, they almost automatically always consider that to be a major penalty or a double minor. Also, game six of the Stanley Cup playoffs last season between the Oilers and the Kings, Mikey Anderson drew the ire of many of the Oilers fans and their players when during a scrum, he tackled Leon Dreisaitl from behind, pulled him backwards and caused uh, Dreisaitl to injure his knee. I don't think he missed any games for that, but he, he wasn't quite the same after that. He played through an injury um, and Oilers fans were obviously very upset about that. And Mikey Anderson and Connor McDavid have gone at it. Uh, the Kings have tried to assign Mikey Anderson their best defensive defenseman on the top player for the Edmonton Oilers win as, as much as possible. And so they've been going at it. Nothing's you know really over the line, but they have been going at it. And I think McDavid saw a chance to put a big hit on a guy who he's had some battles with in the past. And so he did it. Now, I'm not suggesting Connor McDavid did anything premeditated. I don't think this was just something that happened in the moment. And I don't think Connor McDavid is a dirty player. But that doesn't change the, change the fact that, again, he hit a player who he clearly saw his numbers, drove him into the boards, and that player sustained an injury as a result. Uh, one plus one equals two here. And again, that should have been a five-minute major, in my opinion, and he should have been ejected. Now, had the correct call been made, in my opinion, it still doesn't mean the Kings would have won the game. Uh, yes, the Oilers would have lost their top player, and McDavid did kind of had a clinching goal with that shorthanded breakaway in the third period, but the Kings didn't score a goal. So, you know, it's possible to say if that call is made, they still lose one nothing. Um, either way, uh, this is certainly um, something that adds a little more juice to what is a growing rivalry between the LA Kings and the Edmonton Oilers. And um, it's certainly going to make things a little bit more interesting, a little bit more spicy if these two teams do in fact meet again in the Stanley Cup playoffs. I also think it needs to be addressed um, that after that hit, no LA Kings player went after Connor McDavid. Now, to be a little bit fair, the play was still going on. Uh, and in the action, sometimes players don't see the things that we see on TV. So I guess I could understand, you know, kind of immediately after the hit, maybe not reacting to it. And I, I got to believe that it was drilled into the Kings players' heads before the game. And if, and if not by the coaching staff, then by the players themselves, stay out of the box, guys. Don't take any bad penalties. And I can understand maybe you don't want to jump McDavid in that situation because then you give Edmonton a power play and maybe they score an early goal and suddenly the game is kind of you know going in a bad direction before it even really gets started. But that being said, it was certainly a dangerous hit. Um, and you got a teammate laying on the ice and you're just going to stand there and not do anything. I get that it's Connor McDavid and he's, you know, this amazing player, but you're not going to give him a shove, a push, give him a stinky glove in his face, something. They didn't do anything and they didn't do anything to him the rest of the game either. There was no retaliation, no retribution. And again, I'm not suggesting doing something really over the line, but at least let him know that you can't do that. And we're not going to, we're just going to ignore it, basically. Um, that, that was disappointing. And we have it's been talked about. I know some Kings fans have brought it up on this show that the Kings have not really responded to some recent incidences involving questionable hits on players, the hits on Sean Dursey, uh, the bowling into Jonas Corposalo in the Colorado game. Uh, you know, Zach McEwen was in the lineup in this game, although he barely played and he certainly was not noticeable at all. But you would have thought when he got on the ice, and even if you don't go after McDavid, go after somebody. I just, I, I, I just was really disappointed that nobody really reacted to it. And, and again, I'm not suggesting you go up and you sucker punch Connor McDavid or you jump on him and you throw him to the ice. 
but we know we watch enough hockey to understand that you at least send a message and say, Hey man, you can't do that to our teammate. We're not going to stand for that. And you go give them a little push in the face or something, but no response from the Kings. And uh, like I said, that was, that was disappointing. Um, we need to talk also about Sean Dersey. Uh, he made another terrible decision in the game against the Oilers and it cost the Kings a goal. If you didn't see it, Kings were on a power play down one goal early in the third period. And Sean Dersey made an ill-advised pass into the center of the ice, right to Connor McDavid, who took off and scored on a breakaway. And that made it two nothing. And it didn't seal the game at that point. There was still a lot of hockey yet to be played, but it felt like it was a pretty huge goal at the time. And Sean Dersey is a guy who has done this before. And I like Sean Dersey. I think he's a talented player. He has done a lot of good things for the Kings, especially offensively. He a, does a solid job running the second power play unit. But he has on occasion, and it seems like in big games, and it seems like that lead directly to goals, he's had some brain farts, and he's had some boneheaded decisions, and he had another one against the Oilers, and that can't happen. Games of importance that are just going to get bigger and bigger as they go along, he's got to make better decisions. He's got to sometime, sometimes live the fight another day, not make a risky play when it's a one-goal game in the third period, when it's a tie game late in the game. We've seen that before against Vegas at the beginning of the year. So, again, I like Sean Dersey. I really do. I think he's got some talent, but he has got to correct these awful decisions in key moments. And the pressure is just going to get more and more from here going forward in these playoff games and these games down the stretch against Edmonton, against Vegas. And he's got to address it. I, I don't know if at this point, if you're Todd McClellan, if you say, you know what? With all the stuff that Jersey gives us offensively, I'm going to go with Sean Walker instead because he's more reliable defensively. Now, certainly there's a give and take there. If you decide to put Walker in over Jersey, you're losing that offensive ability and you're losing somebody who's got a lot of experience and does a good job running the second power play unit. But I think it's something you have to consider. You got to weigh your options. You got to figure out, you know, does what Jersey gives us offensively, is that enough to mitigate the times when he does make some bad decisions or would we rather take away the offense figure out figure that we'll let our forwards take care of the offense we got to be more reliable defensively it is something to certainly consider but another poor decision by Sean Dersey and it's something that needs to be corrected going forward all right it is time to turn the page on that disappointing loss to Edmonton because the Kings have very important games coming up including this weekend with a pair of games we're going to talk more about that also talk about some news involving a couple of Kings prospects as well. But first, thank you very much for listening and watching this show. Um, Locked on LA Kings, your team every day. Uh, once you're finished, though, with this one, uh, I invite you to check out Lock on, Locked on Game to Game NHL. Every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked on Game to Game covers every game from across the NHL with local analysis and uh, opinions that only Locked on can deliver. It's Game to Game on Locked on NHL. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's check out on the fallout uh, from the games played last night as far as the Pacific Division standing. So Vegas lost in overtime to San Jose. Um, and so they did get a point out of it. But Vegas right now is at 99 points. They did clinch a playoff spot by Nashville losing to Pittsburgh last night. Uh, 75 games left for the Vegas Golden Knights. They are the first team in the Western Conference to officially clinch a playoff spot. The Kings and Oilers should be following shortly thereafter. But thanks to the Oilers win over the Kings, they have now moved into second place. They have 79 points. They're two points back of Vegas for first place. The Oilers have played one more game, 76 games, than both the Golden Knights and the Kings. The Kings right now, 96 points, one point back of Edmonton for second place, three points back of Vegas for first place. So it's still there for the Kings. There's still, like I said, huge points to be had, huge games to be played. The division title is still up for grabs right now. The Kings have head-to-head -head games coming up next week against the Oilers and against the Vegas Golden Knights. Those are huge games. So it's still there for the LA Kings despite that loss last night to Edmonton. As for Seattle, who the Kings are going to play next on Saturday, they're still in the mix in this. They've got 90 points through 74 games. So they've got Two games in hand um, on the Oilers and a game in hand on the Golden Knights and the Kings. So a big game on Saturday 
between the Kings and the Kraken as well. And again, Saturday, Kings take on the Kraken in Seattle. Sunday, the Kings are in Vancouver to take on the Canucks. Big, big games coming up for the LA Kings this weekend, and big points are there uh, ready to be had for the LA Kings. So, got to, again, turn the page. You know, it's just like in the playoffs. You lose a tough game, it's over. It's on to the next game. Same mentality for the Kings after the loss to Edmonton. Turn the page, move forward. Big game's coming up. Let's get going. Uh, we do have some Kings news to mention. We met, we brought this up on Wednesday show, uh, and the Kings made it official later in the day on Wednesday. Uh, the Ontario Reign agreed to terms with forward Alexi Laferriere uh, on an amateur tryout agreement. Laferriere is a former third-round pick of the Kings back in 2020, just wrapped up his career at Harvard, uh, had a standout junior season, and is now turned pro, and he could see action in the Ontario Reigns game coming up tonight uh, on Friday. Uh, and by the way, another recent addition for the uh, Kings organization, defenseman Cole Krieger, made his Reign debut this past Wednesday, had an assist in his first pro game in a 4-2 loss against the Colorado Eagles. Krieger recently acquired in a trade from the Florida Panthers, signed a two-year entry-level deal with the Kings earlier this week, and now he is officially a member of the Kings organization, got his first game under his belt after a stellar career at Michigan State. So again, two prospects for the LA Kings, Alex LaFerriere and Cole Krieger now with the Ontario Reign. And uh, we'll definitely keep an eye on them going forward the rest of the season. All right, coming up on Monday's show, uh, obviously we're going to recap those two big games over the weekend for the Kings. We'll update you on the status of Kevin Fiala, Gabe Velarde, and Mikey Anderson as we have news from over the weekend. Um, if you want to follow our show account to get updated on any news from over the weekend, when we obviously take a, a couple of days off on the show, uh, you can follow us on Twitter. We are at locked on LA Kings. Um, of course, we're going to have another feedback show next week. Certainly. I'm sure some of you will chime in, chime in on the Connor McDavid hit. Uh, the email address is locked on Eddie at gmail.com E D D I E locked on Eddie at gmail.com. One quick note as we uh, sign off for the week. Um, every once in a while, technical issues occur. Now, if you're watching on the YouTube channel, you didn't notice anything, but I, I understand that our Thursday show, as far as the podcast go, apparently did not get uploaded. Um, so, um, that show is now available. It was a, um, a crossover episode between me and Brett Holden, the host of locked on Oilers. Uh, so if you were a podcast listener and you didn't get to hear that, um, it is available now. I know, obviously, it is a bit dated because it was a preview of the Kings-Oilers game. But if you're interested in hearing the opinions, because let's be honest, it's looking like Kings-Oilers could very well happen again in the playoffs. So if you want to hear the perspective of, of, a, of a guy who covers the Oilers on a daily basis and have him talk about what's been going on with the Oilers this season, I think it's still something that you can get something out of. So if you want to go back and check that out, it is up now available on the podcast. And sorry for the for the technical issues with that. All right, I'm Eddie Garcia. As always, thank you for listening and watching Locked on LA Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Wishing you a great weekend. Hopefully we see some good hockey from the Kings over the weekend. We'll talk about it all on Monday. And as always, go Kings go.